But I've heard it sung in many different places. <laughs> and you can, you can look up where that's fun. This, this is a song that a lot of people sing, and they sing it sometimes in the weirdest context. I've seen things sung and I think, why are they singing this song in this context? But the saints marching in, into where, we might ask. Well, of course we would say in this song, the saints would be marching into heaven, we, we might say. But when we talk about heaven in our culture, I don't think anybody cares. And I don't even know if everybody even knows about heaven. The only question that I think you would say to people, if you wanted to go to heaven or hell, where would you go? Where would you want to go? And of course they would pick heaven. I don't think anybody wants to go to hell specifically, would they? I don't think so. But most people don't really talk about the subject much, heaven. And if, even if most people don't think about their eternal destiny, we can, I think, agree together here that heaven is the place where God is. And we want to be part of the kingdom that is eternal, where God is, and so we can classify that as heaven. I think we can agree on that. But the question that the song raises and the question that we can ask ourselves, do I have to be a saint to get into heaven? That's the interesting question. Paul writes to the Ephesians, I am writing to God's holy people in an Ephesus. And in other translations, the words holy people are saints. I'm writing to the saints in Ephesus. The word used for all believers. And Paul uses that nine times in Ephesus. He never uses the word Christian. He always uses the word saint or holy people. And yet both of those words, saints and holy people, are not descriptions we would use for ourselves, would we? We would not say, I want to be a saint or I want to be holy, would we? Sometimes we might even say, well, they're, they're really you know, they think they're better than everybody else. They're, they're this uh, saintly kind of person. I mean, sometimes we put those words down as if they don't have a real good meaning for us. But Paul writes some interesting things in Ephesians, and I want to read a few verses. And if you read the book of Ephesians, you would see the word saint or holy pe people used. I want to read a few verses in Ephesians 1. Verses 1, 13 and 14, and verse 18. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus, who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own, by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us an inheritance he promised. He will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Verse 18. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. Let's think about this for a moment and add on even a verse from 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16 that says, but you must be holy. In everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy, for the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Paul and Peter are picking up on God's descriptions of himself. 
himself and the way God describes his people. But the word saint creates dissonance in our ears because it rubs up against our preconceived notions about saints. Somehow the word saint has a bad rap um, and has come to mean exceptional persons. Only the very outstanding Christians can become saints. Then across the century, the church institution created, as Eugene Peterson suggests, a kind of spiritual hall of fame. Restricted to persons officially installed after rigorous examination. Saints. It's been used almost as a badge of honor or the prize at the end, you're a saint. But think for a moment about one of the first Christians given this description. Who's one of the first persons that was given this description of a saint? Stephanus. Well, Stephanus, but also Mary. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus. Paintings of her, and you know what happens when you're considered a saint? When painters paint, they make a halo then around the people. You've seen all these middle uh, ages pictures of the saints with halos around them. The Holy Family, all of them have halos, making them extra special. These paintings create kind of an otherworldly atmosphere beyond life. I mean, I don't see anybody walking around with a halo in normal life. Do you? Have you seen one lately? I haven't. <laughs> you can tell me. Call me up on my handy if you see somebody who has a halo when you notice them. But this, the scriptures describe in real time Mary was a real person. What made her holy or eventually made her a saint is that she was available to God in real time. She was available to God when he asked her, will you please be involved in my plan? And Mary said, yeah, I'll do it. She allowed the Holy Spirit to work in her and advanced into life as the Lord led her. She raised Jesus. She was with him at the cross. She was there in the upper room. All the way along, Mary was there. Did that make her holy? Did that make her a saint? I think what made her a saint or made her holy was this willingness to be involved in God's story in God's time. That's the key to becoming a saint. She was living in her ordinary life when she became a saint. But it seems hard for us to believe that in our ordinary time, as ordinary believers, we can consider ourselves saints. Before we push on here, let's remember we're not called to be heroes. Our society labels many folk as heroes. And people love heroic things. And I mean, I like some of the heroes too. People who save people from fires or people who do things, unusual things. We're will, willing to celebrate them. But to be a saint is not to be called to be a hero. That helps us. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of recalling all the people of faith, they're not heroes. They're ordinary people living way God wanted to them to, for them to live in their time. People of faith, they're not labeled heroes. I think saints are not heroes. In ordinary time, we are saints because God intends for us to be used by Him. That makes us a saint. You catch that? You get that in your mind tonight, in your heart? God intends for us to be used by Him, and that makes us saints. That makes us 
holy because we allow God who is holy to work in us. I think we need to get that into our hearts and minds and anchor it there. Verses 13 and 14, which we read here, says, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify Him. The Gentiles, those Ephesians, were quite a distance away from any connection to God or things spiritual when they heard about Jesus. The change came when they knew that Jesus came into this world, lived amongst the people, died on the cross, and was raised on the third day. That is the good news, and the good news, and what is the good news? John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, and that love in the good news meant all the Ephesians. All the Gentiles who were living in that city, all the people who had never known about Jesus before, they're included. And you know what? The good news is we are included in that. We don't have to be good beforehand. We don't have to be spiritual beforehand. We don't have to have anything beforehand. We just need to meet Jesus. Isn't that good? The good news saves us rescues people from a lost existence. And what does a lost existence mean? It doesn't mean living in all kinds of horrible things, although that can be part of the lostness. It means that we have lost our true meaning as human beings. If you look at our world today, I think you will find so many examples of people not living up to their calling as human beings made in the image of God. We live in times of violence, we live in times of aggression, we live in times where people are using violence and aggression towards others. That indicates they have lost their humanity. That is, they have lost being in the image of God. If we are in the image of God, we respect others, we love others, we care for other people. Jesus restored our ability to be human beings as God intended because he lived the perfect life on the planet and suffered a death that he did not deserve. And he shows that resurrected, resurrected life gives us life, both here and hereafter. Jesus loves to save. God through Christ loves to save. And God loves to love. God loves to love. I think that's fantastic. We have a God who loves us. Not a God who demands from us. Not a God who pushes in a, us in a corner if we don't do something and is ready to whack us. No. Our God saves us rescues us, snatches us from the burning building, holds us close to himself, runs with us through the fire and the flood to safety. Therefore, because of this good news touching their lives, the Gentiles have changed their identity in Ephesus. They become stamped with the Holy Spirit. They belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that they will receive the promised inheritance. I have a corny comparison. All of us buy drinks, bottled drinks. And if you pay a fee for the bottle, it's a guarantee that when you give the bottle back, you'll receive the fee back. Could you say that our lives were stamped with the Holy Spirit? God has paid a fee for our lives. 
And when we cash in our bottle, we get the full return. Saints, says Eugene Peterson, are identified by what God does in and for us, not by what we do for God. That's good news. It's what God does in us and for us that makes us saints. We can't earn sainthood. I think that's good. That makes us all on even ground. We can't earn sainthood. It's given to us. God re-identifies us as creatures created by Him, saved by Jesus, formed by the holiness by the into holiness by the Spirit. God is retraining our imaginations for understanding ourselves, not in terms of how we feel about ourselves, not in terms of how others treat us, but as God feels about us and treats us. Those ideas from Eugene Peterson, I thought they're powerful. Because sometimes just if we don't feel good about ourselves, we say, well, I don't feel good about myself. Well, that doesn't mean anything to God how you feel about yourself. It does not change his love for you. You may feel lousy, but God still loves you, you see. This is the wonderful part about God's solid commitment to us. It's not dependent on our fluctuating feelings. Because sometimes we feel just plain lousy. Sometimes we feel bad about ourselves. And we can add on other things that we allow to shape our feelings. We're not defined, let me remind you, by our parents, by our teachers. I remember Alfred after he got done with his accident at age 15 and re-entered school again. After having had a complete... Um, skull fracture and a year in the hospital, and he was relearning French. The teacher had nothing better to do than to say, oh, you're never going to become anything but a plumber anyway in your life. She put him down. I wish she would see him now, after a lifetime of doing other things. Not that I'm saying plumbing's wrong. Plumbing's good. We need more plumbers. <laughs> But a teacher that puts us down, it can often affect us. Parents who put us down can affect us. Our employers can affect us. I remember one time when I was teaching, and they said, oh, you're one of the best teachers we have, but we don't have enough money to pay you. Ciao. Ciao. How do you deal with that? Or are we dependent on how our children define us for those of you who are parents? Sometimes children don't always give you wonderful feedback. Or if we don't have education enough, or our appearances aren't what we want, or we've had achievements and failures that don't match up to what we want, none of these things define us who belong to the Lord. Isn't that good news? None of these things define us. Because we have been saved. We've been rescued from our old life. We've been brought into a new position. All of that other stuff is not defining us. We may have to work through it. We may have to deal with it. We may have to wrestle with it. But it does not define us. It is God who defines us because of what He has done for us and is working in us. And all people said, that's good to know. A saint is a word that defines you primarily in terms of who God is for you and what God is doing in your life. A person who is growing up in Christ, a person who cannot be accurately identified apart from God's intense and persistent attention. Thank you, Mr. Peters. We're defined by God. And if you can define yourself to others by not including God, I would raise a question mark whether you know him. The suggestion here is when you get to know Jesus, God begins to define who you are. 
And you can't really live without being connected to Him. We're not secularized things, by the way. We're not numbers or a tax code. We're not defined by those things. We are saints acquiring a God-oriented identity. Now, we have heard our names called by Jesus, those of us who are following him. Remember when Jesus said to those disciples in the New Testament, come and follow me? And what did they do after they heard the call? They began to do the walk. Hearing the call of Jesus to follow means you begin the walk of following him. And so it is for all of us. We hear Jesus call, come. And the response to his come is to walk. Remember when parents have a little kid, little boy or girl, they're getting up from crawling and they're about ready to walk. And the parents say, come, come. And what do they want the child to do? Walk. Jesus says to us after we have heard him, he says, come, follow me, begin to walk. We begin to cooperate with him, and that's involved in this word of saint or holy, cooperation with God. We become increasingly more like Jesus because we're following him closer, and that makes us holy. Nothing else. And this doesn't refer to ourselves as, as if we have accomplished something. But it refers to God who's continually doing something in us as we work together with him. Therefore, the word saint might be a good description for us to use for a while. I challenge you for the next while in church, when we talk to one another, what would happen if we said, Hi, Saint Pedro. Hi, Saint John. Hi, Saint George, Saint John, Saint Linda, Saint Joshua, etc. What if we address one another that way? Wouldn't we be reminded then that our true identity is what God has done for us and in us? If we address one another that way? That this description points us toward further growth. Christ-like holy people means increasingly whole. Holy and becoming whole people rather than fragmented. That's the, that's the joy of growth, becoming more whole. The pieces fitting better together because God knows the puzzle of our lives. Sometimes we don't know ourselves very well. God does. Why can't we let him put us together, you see? It's a beautiful process and it keeps continuing. And at some point a decision has to be made that we enter this adventuresome life of transforming grace. Many people are, we talked about the one young man who's got now a place to do his doctorate work, but if he wanted to graduate from school, if any of us wanted to graduate from a school, what did we have to do? Register in the first place. You can't graduate from a school without registering first. So we can't grow in grace if we've never started the journey. There is a certain decision-making moment when we say, that's what I want. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to receive what he's done for me, personally, internalize it, and I'm going to grow in that grace. We may hear the good news about Jesus, but it only becomes good for us if we sign up, if we take the steps to follow, if we listen to what the Spirit reveals and if we're ready to change from the inside out, not from the outside in. Do you realize how important that is? Jesus, by the Spirit, wants to be within us. The change that we need comes from within. We often want somebody else to do it for us. You know? 
You want, sometimes that's where our complaints lie. They did this to me and that's why I can't do this and I can't be that. If they would change, I could be better. Well, sometimes that's true, but, but deep down, the only change that can happen is within. And if we ask the Spirit to work within us, change will occur. We don't need it from the outside. We really need it from the inside. Sometimes we excuse ourselves from the necessary effort to follow the call of Jesus by saying, well, I'm only human, or we're all sinners. Well, yeah, who didn't say we weren't? Well, what would happen if we took on this new identity seriously and said we're saints? Would that alter your perception? Would that alter your priorities? Would that alter your actions if you really felt, yes, God has called me to become a saint? The shift might be helpful for us. Somehow it might help us just to recognize who we truly are and therefore give us greater stability in ourselves and develop more maturity. Because I think God wants us to grow up into Him. We don't have to be kind of stuck on the same things going over and over and over again. I think we can spin forward or spin into greater development and growth. Paul calls the Ephesians to maturity. He said you need to get beyond just childish food and get into meat and potatoes. Growth. It's, I would say, exciting to grow. It's exciting to become a saint. So, to all of you saints up here, grace, mercy, and peace.